For more than a year, the nation was transfixed by the televised spectacle of the trial of O.J. Simpson. The verdict elated some and stunned others. But the impact of the trial of the century has reached far beyond the confines of courtroom number 103 in Los Angeles. It has sent shockwaves through the entire criminal justice system. Now that the tabloids have lost interest and the media has moved on to more current tragedies, what will be the enduring legacy of this unique chapter in our legal history? What will the long-term impact be on the justice system and the nation? In this special series of programs, Inside the Law will examine in depth the fallout from OJ. Hello, I'm Jack Ford. When you peel away all the other rhetoric in the Simpson trial, the core of the case concerned the conduct of the police investigation by the LAPD and the validity of the forensic evidence. We were all educated at length on the nuances of a valid search and seizure, DNA, hair and fiber analysis, when a person becomes a suspect, blood sample collection, and the role of the coroner. But the question is, will the Simpson case impact police procedures and the use of expert testimony in other cases? Joining us today to explore the impact of the O.J. Simpson trial on the police and forensic evidence are forensic scientist and key member of the Simpson defense team, Dr. Michael Bodden, superintendent of police for Chicago, Matt Rodriguez, O.J. Simpson defense attorney and forensic expert, Barry Sheck, Milwaukee District Attorney Michael McCann, who prosecuted the Jeffrey Dahmer case, prominent defense attorney Jack Littman, Georgetown Law Professor Paul Rostein, and by satellite from Los Angeles, civil rights attorney Melanie Lomax. Lawyers seek to discover new ways to resolve legal issues on Inside the Law. Today's program, the fallout from OJ, the role of the police. We saw that the LAPD and their experts were relentlessly attacked during the course of this trial. The defense attempting to show that their procedures just weren't up to what they should have been, especially for a case such as this. Chief Rodriguez, do you have a sense now that as a result of the attack on the LAPD approach to this case, that all other police officers are now going to be affected? Well, I think they will be, Jack. I, I think a case of, uh, of this notoriety, this, this type of, uh, of uh, major uh, change in the perception of uh, the people in this country is going to have an effect on uh, not only the police, but the ju judiciary, the prosecutors, the defense lawyers. And I think that means it's going to have an effect on policing, because the ultimate test of what police do is, in fact, in that courtroom. And so it's going to have an effect. It's going to have an effect uh, if there's a need for training, we're going to have to provide that training. If there's a need to establish protocols, we're going to have to provide those protocols. We're going to have to meet whatever standards are required. Mr. McCann, are you seeing already uh, an impact on police officers and also prosecutors? Yes, there's no question. People are being trying to be more careful in their collection of evidence. However, we have not seen a negative impact on the DNA. Since that ca uh, case, we've had two cases come down where basically the only evidence was DNA evidence, multiple rape case in one situation, and return guilty on all counts. So the, the fact that there's been a challenge doesn't mean that it's going to be fatal. You have to be more particular, and you have to be certainly more careful as a professional, uh, particularly in the forensic evidence area. Melanie Lomax, you served as the president of the police commission out in Los Angeles during the time of the Rodney King case. Are you getting a sense that morale, especially in Los Angeles, of police officers has plummeted as a result of this case? Absolutely. Uh, I think that uh, the morale is even lower, if that's possible, than it was in 1991 after the uh, Rodney King incident. And again, after the civil disturbances which showed the LAPD in such a poor light performance and competence wise. But Jack, what I want to say is that I think the ultimate message of O.J. Simpson in terms of the police is, is that the authorities have lost their authority. And unless um, Los Angeles and the LAPD submits to the kind of house cleaning and reform, for example, that Chief Willie Williams is undertaking, and that takes place across the country because the problems are the same, then you're going to have jurors 
who distrust and disbelieve and will not rely on the word of the police. And they have to do their own house cleaning and Lee, uh, uh, correct this perception and the reality of the racist rogue cop who's willing to plant evidence and otherwise uses his police powers in a, in a way that abuses his authority. Mr. Sheck, how about that? The idea that, as Ms. Lomax said, the, the authorities are losing their authority and perhaps as a result of the verdict in this case. Well, I think Ms. Lomax is, uh, is correct. I mean, there's two questions. First, where we have to deal with uh, police misconduct. And secondly, is the whole question of forensic laboratories. Let me address the question of forensic laboratories first. I think that what ought to come out of the Simpson case is a recognition that forensic scientists are supposed to be independent scientists, independent of the prosecution, independent of the defense. They're supposed to conduct uh, investigations without bias or uh, fear of favor of either side. Um, a real professionalism has to come uh, into forensic scientists' crime labs. DNA, frankly, <clears throat> is an area where I think over, uh, since 1989 when we began litigating these cases, well, we've brought a measure of professionalism into it, and we've gotten the scientific community to set some pretty high standards there. But it, uh, what, what undermined the evidence in the Simpson case was not the DNA procedures that were put on, as you saw. It was the, as Dr. Lee said, right way, wrong way. There's a right way to do these things. There's a wrong way to do these things. If you don't have the money, if your people are not trained, if they're not independent scientists with a sense of their own professionalism, you got big trouble. Taking a look back at, at police officers and morale, and perhaps most importantly, the image now of police officers in the minds of the public, uh, as a citizen, not as a defense attorney here now, but as a citizen, are you concerned that one of the aftermaths of the O.J. Simpson trial might be that a large portion of the population says, police officer, can't trust him? Well, of course, anyone would be. Uh, I mean, most police officers are risking their lives every day uh, in defense of people uh, like even defense lawyers, I mean citizens, and we all rely upon them, uh, and, and they're sacrificing their lives, and nobody quarrels with that. But I think that the Simpson case revealed something truly ugly. Uh, those Mark Furman tapes are absolutely terrifying. You have to listen to them to believe them. Uh, and unfortunately, we see, for example, now in Philadelphia, there's over a hundred cases that a bunch of cops uh, uh, over a number of years falsified evidence. We had our own Mullen Commission investigations in New York where we had a series of cops in this town uh, that falsified evidence in cases. Uh, there's a lot there and you really have to break the back of uh, a certain insularity within police forces. Who's guarding the guards? We have to really examine that. Internal affairs proved itself to be uh, a toothless tiger in Los Angeles. It was like throwing information down a black hole. Mark Furman was known. Yeah, uh, Jack. He should have been find out, found out. Ms. Lomax. Yes, I was just going to say that I think that the, you know, the ultimate message, again, uh, in the O.J. Simpson case is that in order to restore the authority of the police, you have to restore the public confidence. And in order to do that, what has to be ha what has to happen is twofold in my mind. The first thing is the code of silence must be broken. Willie Williams here in Los Angeles, for example, has, a, has said to his officers that until the code of silence is broken, until the those who police the police uh, are able, uh, until the police themselves are willing to talk about those cops who are violating the law and disclose their uh, malfeasance, then they can't go anywhere from there. And the other thing that has to happen is the understanding that the authority of not only the LAPD has been undermined, but it's been undermined in every major uh, urban police department in the country. And like Watergate, we will live with the consequences of, um, of the O.J. Simpson case in terms of distrusting the, the authorities for decades to come. Dr. Biden, you're in a sort of an unusual position here. You testified um, as part of the defense presentation in the O.J. Simpson murder trial. You're aligned with state police in what you do on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Are you finding that the police that you would come into contact with are, are feeling this, feeling the, the pain, if you would, professional pain, as a result of the verdict? 
Yes, I think police are feeling the pain, but I think they're good police and they're bad police. They're good doctors, they're bad doctors. They're good lawyers, they're bad lawyers. And I don't think the authority of the police is undermined in those areas that respect the police. If you have a, a police department out of control like New Orleans or Philadelphia or, or uh, uh, Los Angeles in some sense, then the populace knows that and the jurors know it. And I think part of what happened is the jurors in the South Bronx here, in the jurors in Los Angeles County, they don't trust the police in many ways because of their own experience. And I think that becomes part of the equation. And there's not that distrust when uh, in, in middle class communities where the poli police are respected and trusted. Mr. Lippman, if, if, if part of the legacy here is to some extent distrust of the police, what do you look to to remedy that? Well, I think what we look to is what Chief Rodriguez is doing, what they're doing in New York now, and in many, many other urban centers in the United States, and that is making the police not a paramilitary force that is invading a community where there is a confrontational stance between the police who look at it as us versus them, but that the police are helping the people just like when all of us remember as kids that you could turn to the cop for help. So this prospect we now have of community policing, where cops are not just whizzing by in patrol cars, but are getting out on the street, dealing directly with human beings, helping them. And cops do a tremendous amount of help. I mean, they're the first social agency that deals with most of the problems that we have in society. The more that you have police out of those patrol cars, not simply investigating crime, but interacting with human beings in the community, as is being done in many communities, that's what I think has to be done at the grass level to inspire confidence that our citizens should have in the police department. Professor Rothstein, you, you teach law, and our justice system is always described as an adversarial system. Does that fact, do you think, contribute to the idea of, of people, in some instances, looking at the police as us against them, and them sometimes being the police officers who are supposed to be protecting them? Well, I think it does, and not only do I teach law, but I taught a course uh, called the O.J. Simpson case. And one of the conclusions of the class was that it may not be possible to have members of one race policing members of another race because you're always going to have suspicions of or the actuality of racism. Uh, that, that message seemed to be coming through loud and clear. Um, I don't think that uh, it's all police or even the majority of police that uh, are rotten apples, as was revealed in this case. I think it's very few. But you know, if you swept that uh, under the carpet, uh, there would be even less confidence in the police because over the long run this would work into an explosive situation. The first step in restoring confidence of the community in the police was to bring it out from under the carpet like this case did and examine it and this would never have come out if it wasn't for two sides of a criminal ca case fighting for their lives and their reputations. It never would have come out. You know they say some other forum would have brought this out. It's not appropriate to examine police misconduct in this forum. That is nonsense. Uh, Chief Rodriguez, uh, we're hearing here an interesting development from Professor Rothstein and people saying, well, maybe you can have people of one race policing another race. How are you dealing with the, the, the race question, the race issue in the aftermath of the O.J. Simpson trial? Well, first of all, we strongly encourage uh, and more than encourage, we try to uh, recruit individuals from, from all of the total community. We try to encourage representation uh, on the police department uh, as it exists in the community. But I, I want to bring something else out. Uh, this kind of painting with a, with a broad brush uh, about internal affairs. Internal affairs may not have worked in some instances in some city, but that is not true throughout the country. I can tell you that I'm also the chairman of Major City Chiefs Association. We, uh, several weeks ago, put out a statement indicating that we recognize what's going on, and, and we talked about Los Angeles, we talked about Philadelphia, we talked about New York, we talked about New Orleans, we talked about Chicago, we talked about where there are problems. And we said, we expect to be scrutinized because that's the nature of our function. It's so sensitive. We expect to be scrutinized, and we want people to scrutinize our activities as much as possible. And we want, to we want them to help us get the road cops, get those few that we, we know are there. Get the, the Furman types out of our, of our respective departments. Uh, At the Jack. same time, they've got to recognize that most police officers in this country are doing a good job and that the crime statistics are indicating that. 
throughout the country. Ms. Lomax? Yes, I would utterly reject this idea that uh, one minority cannot police uh, an, another minority. I mean, I think that that's uh, absolutely preposterous. But in order to have respect, you must earn respect. And in order to earn respect, there has to be not uh, the existence of selective policing, like black and brown men in their cars at night in Los Angeles being special targets. And you can't have all the statistics overwhelmingly show that uh, black and brown people are the subject of more police activity. I mean, that's the, the heart of it. It's, it has nothing to do with white police officers policing black police officers or vice versa. What does this say to us, though? Uh, Mr. Sheck, let me ask you this. What does this say to us, the, the fact that we have here in, in a law school presumably reasonable and intelligent people raising as a question that, well, perhaps we can't allow people of one race to police another race? Well, it's unfortunate that they would draw that conclusion. Uh, it's plainly not impossible. I, I, don't, I don't see this as such a hard question, in a sense, that uh, everybody knows that uh, there have to be uh, more minorities in police forces uh, to give it credibility in the communities uh, um, which are being policed. Uh, that, that just goes without saying. So I don't think there should be any litmus test one way or the other. Um, uh, the real problem in this instance, uh, frankly, when you listen to the Furman tapes, is uh, Furman's attitudes. Furman talked at great length uh, about uh, what he called you know, the N-word but when we use the N-word, almost invariably, he was talking about other black police officers. Uh, so I think that uh, you know, those kinds of attitudes have to be rooted out within police departments. Uh, and I'm sure Chief Williams wants to do that. But when you have something that's built up historically over time, as it was in Los Angeles, it's not an easy job. Mr. McCann, I, I would presume that members of the public, I would presume that perhaps members of our audience here, have walked away from the O.J. Simpson trial having a, a real distrust of police officers. Certainly, if you listen to the tapes of, of Mark Furman, you had to walk away with some sort of impact here. What, as a prosecutor now, what can you do so that when your cases come into a courtroom carried literally and figuratively by police officers, they're not automatically going to be tainted by the Mark Furman problem? I think the reality is that uh, minority people have had a different experience with law enforcement in the United States. For a minority person to be called over walking at night, a man, and men I've known have had this experience, boy, come over to this police car. Uh, that right away, your whole suspicion of whether police are racist or not, the majority of white people I don't think have those experiences. They do trust police. When the Furman stuff surfaced, many black people would say that proves it, they're racist. Many white persons said, that's a racist cop. In other words, the, the reaction to it was very different. I understand what that jury did, what they felt the suspicion of the whole case was put at issue. And I think what's got to be done is not simply to say tolerance. We have to go way beyond that to in, in, enhance as best we can among our police officers a real appreciation. Uh, we have to have well-integrated police departments at all levels, from, uh, right from the bottom right to the top, uh, to aggressively promote to anyone that wants to be a policeman, that you can't be a racist, that there's no room for that, and right uh, to aggressively identify as best we can. Not easy, by the way, to get rid of an officer uh, under civil service regulations, even when you suspect he has, has biases. But to, from the top on down, and uh, with a, a chief such as Rodrigo was saying forcefully, we don't want racists, and committed through it all the way down. That's how you've got to do it. It may take a couple of decades to do it. We are a racist society in many ways. We cannot expect that our police department is a part, and yet we have such serious obligations. We've got to make every effort, as hum much as humanly possible, to see that our departments are free of racist individuals, not an easy challenge. Jack, you know, if, um, yeah, if right um, uh, you don't clean up the police department, and again, it's isolated to certain police departments in certain areas. But if you don't clean up the police department, it's just not a matter that innocent people are going to get snared into the system. It's also that guilty people are going to go free because That's the right. lawyers like uh, Barry Sheck and company are going to make hay out of this racism or incompetence in the police department even when it isn't there. I'm not saying it wasn't there in that case. And, that, and they're going to get uh, guilty people off, too. Dr. So it's got to be done. Dr. It's Dr. Yeah. Just as an outsider, yeah. the simple answer to not uh, using uh, bad testimony is that district attorneys should have an obligation to evaluate testimony by the police, just as they do by, of medical experts, 
in Los Angeles, the district attorney decided not to use the coroner who did a very fine autopsy on the two autopsies because they didn't like his testimony. They could have evaluated uh, Mark Furman, and I think we have a scandal now in New York City <clears throat> where hundreds of people were indicted and arrested and convicted on bad, uh, bad police testimony. Where was the district attorney evaluating the testimony? They know, I know when, a, when police aren't giving proper testimony, when they enhance the evidence to make sure the bad. In, in, um, in Chicago, not Chicago, DuPage County, mm -hmm. uh, Cruz, two, Cruz and Hernandez were death row for 13 years, uh, even after the Illinois State Police testified for uh, the uh, defense. I was involved in one of the case and reviewed it. Clearly, they weren't guilty. Clearly, the DNA evidence recently exonerates them. And the prosecutors still won't give up on the case. And they still, so they have their own biases. And I think there's a big role for prosecutors to evaluate and not embrace somebody who they know, as Furman was, who was a racist. Ms. Yes. Lomax. And if we want uh, to have a society when the, where the guilty are adjudicated as, as such, as opposed to jurors sending messages, then I, I hate to use uh, a Johnny Cochran's line, but you have to trust the messenger in order to trust the message. And I think that uh, what happened here clearly is that the message or the evidence was never evaluated by this jury because they didn't believe in those and trust in those who were involved in gathering it. And, uh, and it resulted, in my opinion, of course, in a, in a terrible result that had nothing to do with uh, real innocence, but the jury sending a message. But we can't absolve ourselves of the responsibility. We can pin it on DAs. We can pin it on, you know, the officials in the police department. We have to accept the responsibility as a society. For many years, what the majority has done in this society, we said to the police, there's a problem in those cities. You take care of it. Lock the people up. We just don't want to know what you're doing. And many people just turned a blind eye to what the police were doing. Move out to other communities, let them deal with the problem, and it'll solve our crime problem. And when the dirty laundry comes to the surface, it becomes a stain on all of us. Chief, let me, uh, Chief, let me ask you this. And, and, and echoing what many have said here already, which is that the vast majority of police officers are good, honest, hardworking people. I, I saw a suggestion once that said we expect too much from our police officers. In a way, we, we expect them to be, in a sense, constitutional lawyers, to know precisely for search and seizure issues, for instance, when they can go, use the illustration here, over the wall into somebody's property, such as O.J. Simpson's home. Do you think we're expecting too much of our police officers, and, and as a result, it puts them into situations where they might find themselves Shading the truth a little bit? Not in those areas. Uh, we expect too much of police officers in terms of wanting them to take the place of parents, school teachers, doctors. But in those areas, no. We should train our officers sufficiently so they don't jump where they shouldn't jump. They don't search where they should, sh shouldn't search. And they should uh, collect evidence in a manner that they should collect it. And I think uh, the good that's going to come out of the O.J. Simpson trial and, and some of the problems that, uh, that were raised there is that we in policing are going to change where we need to change. We're going to train where we need to train. And we're going to make uh, the application of good sound management principles where they're needed. We, you know, I'm, I'm a police officer who went through the 1960s. And I remember the Warren Court. And I remember as a police officer, a young police officer, wondering whether we're ever going to arrest anyone in the face of these new restrictions and constraints. We survived that. We filled the courts. We filled the jails. Okay, we know how to do that. And we'll survive this also. We'll be a better policing uh, arm of the criminal justice system in the United States because of what we learned. Here, here, and I think we need to pay police much more money for this terribly difficult and demanding and dangerous task. I mean, uh, we pay people uh, in sports and entertainment uh, and recording uh, huge sums of money, and yet the people who are the thin blue line between us and chaos are, are paid virtually nothing. I think that's a crime. And I think I agree with that, but I think that the uh, one of the things that has to be clear here is the burden, the primary, the preponderant burden uh, is on the police officers themselves to discipline themselves and be willing to break 
ranks with their colleagues when they are engaged in misconduct. This misconduct doesn't take place in isolation. The other good cops know what's going on, and they let the others who are not engaged in proper activity uh, uh, get away with it in the name of being collegial or, 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 or not uh, breaking the ranks. And that has got to stop. And until that one thing stops, there will be no reform of any police department. Mr. Schecht, do you expect as a result of what happened in that courtroom in Los Angeles that that there'll be progress made here in terms of police how they do their jobs and how they're perceived by the public I'm not as optimistic as everybody else these are all fine sentiments everybody said the right thing uh, but there's a very tough task Miss Lomax is talking about breaking the blue wall of silence that is very hard I will tell you it is hard to break a code of silence for doctors it is hard to break a code of silence for lawyers. Uh, people will naturally protect each other. Uh, what you have to have is, you know, real tough review, whether it be internal affairs or civilian uh, complaint review boards, but real internal um, and maybe to some degree external supervision of the police, and it has to start from the top down. It has to be that certain kinds of attitudes won't be tolerated. It's not just graft, it's racism, it's sexism, it's uh, certain kinds of attitudes won't be tolerated. That's not so easy. Uh, it, it really isn't. It's got to be sy systematic. It can't be just a lot of uh, pieties. Although it does appear that there were a great deal of differences of opinion over the O.J. Simpson murder trial, it does also appear that one of the legacies of the trial of the century is that it has caused many police departments around the nation to re-examine their procedures for investigation and collection of evidence at homicide scenes. And both prosecutors and defense attorneys are now paying closer attention to the analysis and use of forensic evidence, including DNA. I'd like to thank my guests, also our studio audience, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us inside the law. Yes, um, as a citizen, I guess my primary concern would be, is it going to be impossible for prosecutors over the next 10 years to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt if any misstep on the part of the law enforcement arena is going to result in an attack on the credibility of all of the evidence? And I guess I'd like to know what Mr. McCann thinks about that. Well, certainly we're a case, and we've had several hung solely on DNA. The victim could not, in rape cases, could not identify the offender. In such a case, if there's been a defect,